Well, as we uh, prepare ourselves for the table of the Lord, uh, I want us to turn to the book of Romans. I would encourage you to read that book and study that book. And if you're new with us and you've never studied Zechariah, show up tonight as we start a book study in that wonderful book. Zechariah is quoted in the New Testament, some say, more than Isaiah. I don't know that that's true. I haven't checked that out. But there's an awful lot of New Testament quotations from the book of Zechariah. <laughs> 14-chapter book versus Isaiah, 66-chapter book. And, there, of course, Zechariah is the book that predicted Jesus would ride into the Jerusalem on the donkey. And Zechariah is the book that predicts that Jesus will come back to Jerusalem and they'll look on him whom they pierced and repent. Amazing prophecies in that book. But I will say this, the last part of Zechariah is the fun part. The first part is the hard part. But if you really want to understand it, you got to get the whole thing. So come to Ze uh, Sunday evening, even if you've not, uh, it'll be just 14 chapters of that book, and we hope that you'll join us for that study this summer. We studied it one, uh, all summer 13 years ago, no, 11 years ago, and so uh, we're going to try it again. Okay, this morning, I want to look at Romans chapter 1. We've been trying to give you an appetite for the book of Romans so that you will read it and study it on your own. And if you do that and have a lot of questions, we do have commentaries on the book of Romans that you might also want to consult, and we'd be glad to lend you one or sell you one or whatever. <clears throat> the Apostle Paul, at this point, had never been to the city of Rome as a missionary, and he's writing to the church at Rome to introduce himself and his message. And so uh, that's what's going on here. And it takes him 16 chapters to do it. And aren't we glad it did? He said, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he'd promised before by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. He's talking about the gospel of God that he preached concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and he, this is the new part this morning, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Father, thank you for the time we can spend. Again, some, for some of us, this book is somewhat familiar. For others, it might be very brand new. We pray, Father, your blessing on this study and use it as you see fit, both here and those that listen online. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, Paul is coming to a church that doesn't know him. Uh, and Paul is coming to a church that was founded on the gospel. So he's not telling them something they don't know about the gospel. He's telling them something they don't know about himself, and that he, as an apostle to the Gentiles, preaches the same gospel they heard from Peter uh, in Acts chapter 2, uh, when the church at Rome was founded from that event. And Paul is identifying himself and his message. We are living in a time when personalities trump message. You like the person, you don't care much of what they teach. That's a very terrible, terrible way to go about church. And the Apostle Paul understood that these folks needed to be encouraged that his message, uh, even though he was primarily apostle to the Gentiles, where Peter was an apostle to the Jews, his message was compatible with Peter's message, and that, so he goes into a lot of detail on his message, which he calls the gospel of God, and 
how it applies to them at Rome, which was at this point a church filled with Jews and Gentiles. And so as we look at this, we are already into the argument of the Apostle Paul. I want to come back and uh, talk about this. He says, my message is a certified message. Uh, you know, there's people that need to be certified. Certified grade A beef. You, you go to the doctor's office, you look for the diploma. Did this guy graduate from that <laughs> school? Uh, your, your teachers have to have certification, don't they? Remember when my wife was teaching, she had to keep going back to school and, uh, and so forth, uh, take courses and so forth. And uh, uh, medicine has to be approved of, and certain, at least most of the time. And uh, especially in spiritual things of eternal importance, of great gravity, the teachers and the teacher's message should both be certified. We ordain pastors, don't we? You know what that is? You know how ordination takes place? You don't become ordained because you graduated from a school and got straight A's or even B's and A's or B's, A's and C's. You get ordained because a group of pastors have an ordination council, and you are examined as to your doctrine, as to your life, as to what you do and what you believe. If you fail that exam, you're not ordained. So the church ordains, not the ordination council, but the ordination council who examines you uh, sends a letter to the church from which you ordain and said, we recommend this person to be ordained by you. And why do you bring in pastors and elders from other churches and other places to examine someone and ask any question they want to ask about what do you believe about this in the Bible? Or uh, the wife is brought in, they ask her about her husband, which is a good thing to do. Because you, you, it's part of certifying an individual to do ministry so that people feel somewhat confident in his abilities. That doesn't mean ordination councils sometimes make a mistake. Uh, sometimes you don't uncover something you should. I was on one that that happened to years ago. Uh, so were a lot of men better than me. It's up in Michigan. And we ordained somebody I wish we hadn't ordained. But most of the time, things are brought out that need to be brought out. So especially in spiritual things, uh, church buildings are inspected. You can't build a building without the state saying, this building's got to be safe. We're in that process right now for this remodel of this building again. We went through it 40 years ago. The state has things they want to look at, and you have to do it according to code. Why? Safety of the people that come to the building. So these things, uh, certification is not a bad thing. There's many areas of life where it's extremely important. It's certainly important when it comes to spiritual things. as God certified this message and this person who's bringing it. And so what Paul does as he moves through this in verse 1, my message is from God. It's the gospel of God. My, the subject of my message is God. <laughs> and the certification of my message, it's a threefold certification. We've been looking at this. Two weeks ago, we saw there's a scriptural certification in verse 2, which he promised before by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, this gospel of God. There's a historical certification in verse 3 we looked at last Sunday uh, concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. 
That's something that happened in history, not in one moment, but over thousands of years. How much certification do you need? A Davidic covenant that was given by God to King David a thousand years before Jesus was born was behind the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem and was behind his coming into this world. There's a historical certification of the gospel of God. Um, and there are now, this morning, a supernatural certification. It says, and declared to be the Son of God, verse 4, with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection of the dead. That's the last of a three-part certification process that Paul is identifying for the re readers of his epistle. And we're going to talk about the resurrection of Jesus Christ and how it certifies the gospel and that it's only just one part of a three-tier certification. There's a scriptural certification, there's a historical certification, and there's a supernatural certification. Now, all this is linked in verses 2 to 4. It's all coming off verse 1. It's the gospel of God. How do I know it's the gospel of God? All kinds of people say they got a message from God. It's a certified. Now, the Bible is a unique book among all books that have ever been written and the only people that don't see that are those who've never read it or lightly read it or only read it to find fault. That's where a lot of people, how a lot of people read the Bible, they read it to find fault, they read it to sneer. We don't sit in the seat of scorners. Scorners read the Bible. I, how can I twist this? How can I use this against Christians? I want a website that has atheists and Christians, and they're writing back and forth. And the stuff that I read, not on a website, it's on my Facebook page. And the stuff that you read, it just makes me sad. This attitude of scorn. Those people could read the Bible a hundred times and never come out with anything because they're not looking to learn. They're reading it with the veil on their heart like the Jews do, as according to Paul. Their minds are blinded by the God of this age. And they think they're so smart. They think they're so superior. They're bursting with unbelieving pride, mocking, and I want to tell you something. The Holy Spirit will tell you nothing with that attitude. You learn nothing. I don't care what your IQ is. So the Bible is a unique book among all books that have ever been written. Only the people that have never read it or read it to find fault rather, rather than read it to find truth have a problem with it. Now, I'm not saying we should leave discernment behind when we read the Bible. I'm not saying we shouldn't ask questions and search things out. I am not saying that. That's a good thing. There's intellectual issues that you want to look at, think about, and read about, ponder. But the, uh, this unique book that Paul talks about in and, and the unique this uh, of it is he talks about in verse two, what the Bible is among books, the resurrection of Jesus is among miracles. The Bible stands out among all the other books that have been written. And the resurrection stands out about all uh, from all the miracles that have ever been performed. And 
Then in verse 3, we find that Jesus was royalty. That through his father and his mother, he was genetically and legally related to King David a thousand years before. Most of mankind aren't related to royalty. Most of us don't have any kings in our background. You go on 23andMe and they might tell you, oh, you were related to so-and-so. Well, okay, good. They didn't tell me that. Uh, and so most of us wouldn't even have a senator or a congressman or a mayor in our genealogy, but let alone a king. And so the Apostle Paul uses genealogy. A genealogy was in the Jewish temple. <clears throat> a genealogy was kept by the anti-Christians in the Jewish temple while Paul wrote this. And millions of Jews have, are not of the tribe of David. That's family of David or the tribe of Judah. But Jesus was of the tribe of Judah and the family of David. The line God made a covenant with that Messiah would come from his loins. So the Lord Jesus is amazingly unique. There was a book written before he was born about him. Nobody else has ever had that. And there was a he had royal parents that were in the line of King David. You can't, nobody can make that happen. You know, anybody can legitimately say, there was a book written about me before I was born. A lot of people have books written up about them after they're dead, but... <laughs> You can't control history. You can't control what happens before you were born. And you can't control who your parents are. Could you control who your mom and dad were? No. How about your grandparents? How about all your ancestors? You can't control that. That's beyond your control. Either you are or you aren't. So Jesus had a uh, Jesus had a biblical background. He had he had a scriptural background. He had a historical background. A historical background that was not just about him and what he did and what he said, but a historical background that was before he was born. That's a two tier accreditation and certification. The third tier is what we're talking about today, a supernatural accreditation. And none of these three are possible by human manipulation. The Bible's a book among books. Jesus' genealogy is a genealogy among genealogies. And the miracle of the resurrection from the dead of Jesus is a miracle among miracles. Who else do you know that's been risen from the dead? You say, well, uh, uh, how about uh, Lazarus? I know about him. How about the little girl Jesus raised? How about, no, those were resuscitations. Those people lived, got old and died again. When Jesus was risen from the dead, he was risen incorruptible, immortal. And he, he said, I am he that lives and was dead, and behold, I'm alive forevermore. He was the first of an end-time resurrection permanent one. So all these are amazing things. No one can legitimately have a book written about them before they were born, although it's been tried. Now, there were a couple of other people who had a few verses in the Bible written about them. Uh, John the Baptist had a couple of verses in Isaiah 40 and a verse in Malachi 3. Remember that? Cyrus is mentioned in Isaiah. Muhammad claims that uh, uh, that uh, a lot of the Bible verses are about him. Did you know Muslims say the comforter that Jesus talked about is really Muhammad? Really? Really? Does that shoe fit? That's not even close. Muhammad lived 500 years later. 
and he's anything but the comforter. Claims are not proofs. And so, uh, these are amazing things, good things. You can't control your DNA, can't control who your parents are, or grandparents or great-grandparents. I just found that my, when I was at my uncle's house this last week, taking care of some of his affairs, I found my aunt's father, my grandfather, and his last driver's license. And he died at 75 or 6. I'm 75. And I looked, my, my, they, 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 my brother looked at that license, his last, my grandfather's last license, and he looked at a picture of me, said, that looks like Bill. Well, I knew that. I knew I looked like my grandfather somewhat, my maternal grandfather. Uh, but, you know, you can't, you can't choose who you look like. You can't choose your background. And uh, you can't choose who your parents are or your grandparents. It is what it is. And no one certainly can be raise themselves from the dead. Many have claimed it. Many false messiahs have claimed it. But only one man in history has clearly achieved it in any credible way at all. Moses is dead. Muhammad's dead. Buddha's dead. Confucius is dead. Lao Tse is dead. <laughs> There's one person who's unique who said, I was dead, but now I'm alive forevermore. And Paul met that person. What turned Saul into Paul? What made a persecutor of Christianity who was trying to stamp it out and the message of Christian of Jesus out, who hated it, hated Jesus, hated the Christian gospel, hated Christians enough to murder them. What made him a proclaimer of the message? One thing, he met the risen Jesus Christ on the road of Damascus and immediately began to preach Jesus is the Son of God. He didn't have to have 10 years of school to get that. He just, he met him. Who are you, Lord? I'm Jesus, whom you're persecuting. Oh, I'm on the wrong side. What do you want me to do? And he probably thought, he's probably going to say, kill yourself. But that's not what Jesus said at all. The risen Lord commissioned Paul to preach the faith he once denied. And so there's a supernatural certification here that was prefigured even in the Bible. I haven't got time to look at this, but do you remember the whole business with Elijah and the Baal prophets? And what did Elijah say with that big sacrifice there, and the pale prophets are dancing around. And remember, Elijah set up a test. Let the God who answers by, be, by, by fire be God. It's fire from heaven. Pale prophet, prophets prayed all day and got nothing. Elijah prayed once. And the fire fell from heaven and devoured the sacrifice. And the test wasn't the ant God that answers by rain be God. That's what they needed. They had a three-year and a half-year drought. But they needed something more. They needed to know about God who accepts sacrifice. Well, sin was behind the drought. And one of my, one of my favorites is Aaron's rod that budded. Number, number 17, they're arguing who's got the right to be priest. Who's one? All of God's people are holy. Everybody's equal. It's all, who, who's the, 
Who, who's got the right to be a priest? Aaron, you're taking too much on you. All right, let's put the, the rod of Levi and all the rods. Everybody put their staff in. We're going to put it up near the sanctuary, and we're going to look tomorrow and see what happens. And Aaron's rod budded. It budded. It produced almonds. Now, this pulpit has been in this church a long time. I've never seen anything grow out of it. You ever seen any branches coming out of the pulpit? Any flowers? It's springtime. Where are they? It's dead wood. The trees that are alive bring forth buds and leaves and so forth, not dead wood. But Aaron's rod, which was like a shepherd's staff, and all the others, it alone of all the ones budded and brought forth flowers. Number 17, read it. God was saying, if you got multiple truth claims, and everybody says, I'm the one, look for my miracle. I'll give you a miraculous supernatural authentication of which one is right. When you have rival truth claims, can be defeated by unique miracles. And so, may God help us to think about the resurrection of Jesus that way. Now, the resurrection of Jesus is mentioned in verse 4 for the first time in Romans. It's not the only time. It's certainly not the last time. And that supernatural accreditation and certification is mixed in with historical and a scriptural certification. And But let's read it again. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who was made of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection of the dead. By whom? By the risen Savior, the Son of David, risen Savior, by whom we receive grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. This is for everybody. Everybody needs to know this. Now, the medicine I take for my health, you might not need to take. I've got high blood pressure. I'm on my Cinepril. Could I say, the Cinepril for everybody. <laughs> Everybody's got, got to take some Cinepril. Not if you don't have no, you don't have high blood pressure. And even if you have high blood pressure, maybe you'll take Lusartan or something else. Well, right, what right would I have to say? The whole world has to uh, take lisinopril because I take it and it does some good for me. You see, what was coming here is this, everybody needs Jesus Christ. Uh, Why? All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. My blood pressure is nothing compared to coming short of the glory of God. You're coming up short. I'm coming up short. We got a big problem. Christians and non-Christians, everybody comes up short. The Christian is someone that knows the antidote for this. It's the death of our Savior on the cross and his resurrection. These are basic things, precious things, wonderful things. Now, as you look in verse 4, uh, excuse me, verse 3, Jesus was the Son of God in weakness before he was the Son of God in power. Now, he's the eternal Son of God. He's existed as a second person of the Trinity eternally. Uh, we don't believe in the eternal generation of the Son. At least I don't. Some Christians do. I, I, I think that's gobbledygook. I don't think that says anything. I believe he's the eternal Son of God as the second member of the Trinity. But I don't believe begotten in John 3.16 refers to eternal generation, an opera ought entry within the Godhead. I believe it's, uh, I believe, Begotten should be translated unique son of God. We taught on that Sunday night. You missed it. Get the tape. We're here. So there's two historical stages in the career of the eternal son of God. Stage one, 
humiliation became of the seed of David. Now, you and I would think if I got to be in the family of a king, that would be an exaltation. But it was a humiliation for the eternal son of God to become the son of David. He's coming down. What for us would be a promotion was his, for him, a demotion. So stage one is the humiliation concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. That's Christmas. That's Mary and Joseph. They both were of the seed of David. Physical right to the throne from his mother, legal right to the throne through his father. He was made of the seed of David, born in Bethlehem, which was the city of David. Stage two, exaltation and declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. That is exaltation. There's a British Greek scholar who was uh, very, very prominent when I was in seminary 50 years ago. His name is C.E.B. Cranfield. He wrote a very scholarly two-volume set on the book of Romans, and um, he said this on this verse. Who was appointed son of God in power in contrast with his being son of God in apparent weakness and, and poverty in, time, in the time of his earthly existence. He was appointed son of God in power. In 1 Corinthians 15, 23 says he was raised in power. And Martin Lloyd-Jones, the British preacher, said the resurrection enables us to see him as he really is and what he is. While he was in heaven, the flesh uh, was he, while he, excuse me, while he was here in the flesh, much was hidden. When Jesus walked around, people didn't say, oh, there goes God. He, he, he was, his, his glory was veiled. But there was a historical beginning for Jesus. It was when he was born in Mary's womb, formed in Mary's uh, womb in the virgin conception. And he was a helpless baby and nursed and cared for. And, but there's a historical beginning also of his exaltation. He was risen and ascended. The Swiss commentator Godet, writing on Romans, said, declared, in verse 4, is insufficient, for the resurrection of Jesus not only manifested or demonstrated what he was, it wrought a real transformation in his mode of being. When you think of Jesus, do you think about pictures of him walking around? You know who, how he is now? John knew him. He used to lean on his breast, but then when he saw the risen, ascended Jesus, he fell at his feet dead. Same Jesus, but shocked. Gerhardius Voss, a, a, a Presbyterian uh, theologian, said the resurrection of both Jesus and believers is the entering upon a new phase of sonship characterized by the possession of unique supernatural power. Well, how do you think about Jesus? Do you see him as he is or as he was 2,000 years ago? Why Pentecost? He has shed forth this, which you now see and hear. You crucified him and he just did this? You're in trouble. Why Paul getting saved? You can't explain Paul without Jesus. You can't explain Paul without the resurrection of Jesus. The only thing that explains Paul's conversion is he met Jesus Christ. He was immune to human preachers. Stephen preached one of the best messages ever preached, and Paul held the coats of those who killed him and approved of his death. I read Stephen's message, and I think, I wish I could preach like that. So why Pentecost? Why Paul getting saved? Why the mission to Gentiles around the world for the last 2,000 years that 
prophecy predicted in Psalm uh, 22, the same Psalm that predicted Jesus' death and resurrection, predicted the gospel going around the globe, why Isaiah 53 and the same thing. These are, then why is the book of Acts, the book about all that Jesus, uh, the former book was about all Jesus began to do and teach. Now we're talking about what he's doing and teaching. So the resurrection of Jesus, guess what it was? It was the first end time resurrection. And so far it's been the only end time resurrection. It's a permanent resurrection, never to be undone by death. He was the firstborn from the dead. That's what the Bible says. He's the first fruits of those that sleep. That's what the Bible says. It's an end time. We are in the end times. The end, are we in the end times? We've been in the end times for 2,000 years. The end times started with the coming of Christ and his resurrection. You didn't know that. You read your Bible, it's there. In these last days, he's spoken to us in his son. We're not at the beginning of history. That's the book of Genesis, the book of beginnings. We're not in the middle of history. That's the Old Testament. We, for 2,000 years, have been in the end times. Now, there is an end at the end. <laughs> We're not there yet. We don't know how long it's going to last. So our Lord's sonship uh, was veiled in some sense when he became a man and lived a humble life, but now it's been upgraded to use the modern terminology. And uh, James Dunn, who's certainly not a conservative Christian, but he, at least he could be honest with the Greek text, says all he says here is that the new phase of Christ's existence and role was characterized by the Holy Spirit just as his spirit's previous phase was characterized by his human flesh. So Paul says, I got good news. It's from God. It's credible. It's about Jesus Christ. It's totally credible with a threefold accreditation. And the last part of the accreditation, it was supernaturally verified by resurrection. People say, oh, pastor, people, people believe in the resurrection back in the 2,000 years ago or even 500 years ago, but we don't believe that today. We're too sophisticated. We have too much knowledge today and so forth. It's unscientific. Ancient man didn't have what we've got, all that kind of stuff. And modern Western philosophy defines God out of existence and out of relevance. And you know how it does it? Word games. Word games. They... They, have, they follow a philosophical cons, construct that's just a philosophical construct. And they define God and miracles out of possibility and say it's unscientific. Um, there's bright people, brilliant people, people with higher, much higher IQ than you and me that are locked into a false theological construct. <coughs> and they can't <coughs> hear or see anything out of that. Natural laws should not be defined as to what actually happens, but what regularly happens. You know the difference of that? You know, people say scientifically there can't be any resurrection of the dead. Why? Natural laws... Tell us it can't happen. Natural laws should be defined as what act, should not be defined as to what actually happens. Only what this natural law says can happen. Nothing can happen outside this. Natural laws should not be defined as to what actually happens, to, but what regularly happens. That's why we can have science, because certain things regularly happen. But there's assumption when you start saying it's what actually happens. It's an anti-supernatural bias of fallen man that's based on unfallen assumptions. It assumes that all phenomena ultimately must admit and only can admit a natural explanation. They've got 
a glasses on that only let them see certain things. And they won't take the glasses off. It's an overly restrictive definition and therefore a false one. Very, very simple. Very, very simple. If God exists, miracles are possible. That's pretty simple, isn't it? If there is no God who can act, then you can't have any miracles. But if there, if there is a God who can act, then there can be acts of God. It's simple, isn't it? But you've defined existence so that you can't even have a God and then say, I've got proof there isn't a God. A miracle is a divine intervention, a supernatural exception to the regular course of natural events. Now, David Hume didn't like that, and certain German philosophers don't like that, that people spend their lives studying these guys. Oh, they're smart. You read their writings, you think, boy, this guy's got a high IQ. Yeah, but he's still wrong. A miracle is a special act of God that interprets the natural cause of events. If there's no God, there can be no real miracles. But if there's a personal God, you mean he can't do something other than the natural laws he set up? Does he have to limit himself? No. If God exists, he can act and speak. And so in Romans 1, I've got a message from God, that message about Jesus, and it's accredited by God himself. It's certified. People say, well, the odds are against it. The odds are against a resurrection from the dead. Yeah, the odds are against a perfect bridge hand. Right? You ever play bridge? I used to play bridge when I was a freshman at OU. I forgot how to play it. Don't, don't ask me to play now. I don't remember. But I read someplace that a, a bridge hand, the odds of a perfect bridge hand is 1,635,013,555,000 and 600 to 1. I don't think I'd be betting on that one. But we're not, we're, we're, we... We're not dealing with odds. We're not dealing with probabilities. We're not betting on a horse race here. This is not what we're dealing with. We're dealing with a personal God who's revealed himself in a very credible way. And we can't see outside the box. We've got our little way of looking at life it's a presupposition, and that's where people always go wrong on their presuppositions that are not recognized and acknowledged. T.S. Eliot said, where is the wisdom we've lost in knowledge just because we don't have categories? We don't have categories because we haven't thought about those categories. One writer said, I once heard the missionary author Elizabeth Elliot. Anybody know who that is? Remember Jim Elliot was martyred in Ecuador? I know, I, I know some of you know that. She said, I once heard the missionary author Elizabeth Elliot tell of accompanying uh, an, the Aka woman, Dayuma, from her jungle home in Ecuador to New York City. Can you imagine that? You live in the jungle, it's the 1950s, and somebody takes you to New York City. Listen, I've been to New York City. It is different. <laughs> different than Athens. But we have some category. Can you imagine what it's like, what it was like for that woman? And as they walked the streets, Elliot explained cars, fire hydrants, sidewalks, red lights. Dayuma's eyes took in the scene, but she said nothing. Elliot next, Elliot next led her to the observation platform atop the Empire State Building, where she pointed out tiny taxi cabs and people on the streets below. Again, Dayuma said nothing. Elliot could not help wondering what kind of impression modern civilization was making. Finally, Dayuma pointed to a large white spot on the concrete wall and asked, what bird did that? <coughs> At last, she found something she could relate to. 
And the same author said, I finished, I visited the tip of Argentina, the region named Tierra del Fuego, the land of fire by Magellan's explorers, who noticed fires burning on the shore. The natives tending the fires, however, paid no attention to the great ships as they sailed through the straits. Right past their eyes. And this is what it said. They later explained they'd considered the ships an apparition, so different were they from anything they'd ever seen before. They lacked the experience, even the imagination, to decode evidence passing right before their eyes. The natural man receives not the things of what? The Spirit of God, neither can he know them. He's spiritually blind. Satan has blind the minds of the lost, lest the light of the glorious gospel should shine to them. And they're very happy. They, they, they can't think outside that box unless the Holy Spirit works in their heart. One more illustration. Most of us are old enough to remember when John Glenn flew in space. I'm not salting some of you young people, but we remember that. <coughs> and I've flown with John Glenn. Well, with John Glenn, it was on an airplane going from Columbus to <laughs> somewhere else. We were on the same plane. But John Glenn, <coughs> when he was going to space, and they were going to, he's going to go around the Earth three times. He had to do the math on it. How you had to get somebody from from out of space? How do you go from an elliptical orbit to a par parabolic orbit? I don't even know what that means, but. Anyway, they had that math problem. So they're trying to do the math, and the math's not working. And the clock is ticking, and they got to solve this problem. They had a lot of black women that were working, smart women, brilliant women, <laughs> that knew math. And, uh, <laughs> and there's a movie about that called Hidden Figures. It's a good movie. But the, 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 the guy who was in charge of everything says, maybe we've been thinking about this all wrong. And then that black woman said, oh, it's Euler's method. I don't even know what Euler's method is. Euler's method is some kind of old mathematics, ancient math. We're using new math. We need old math. You see, we were stuck in one way of looking at an issue. How do we get John Glenn back to Earth? When they used the old method, it was constructed different, and the answers were there. And before John Glenn took off, he wanted to know about that black lady. Did she check these figures? <laughs> That's all I cared about. Now, you see what happened to those mathematicians? Now, I'm no mathematician. My last, I, I took Algebra 2 and Geometry, and that was my top level <laughs> mathematics. I didn't try to go higher than that. Mathematicians are smart people, but if they're in a box and they can't see anything out of that, they can be blind to what's right there, and they're not seeing it. That's the way every non-Christian is. That's the way Paul was. He had a theological construct that was wrong. He couldn't see Jesus risen from the dead, and we got modern people all over the place that smarter than us, smarter than others, they don't know. They don't get it. You got all kinds of people. People, oh, I like this philosopher. I like this writer. I like this person. Uh, uh, you know, Karl Marx, he's our man. Sigmund Freud, Albert Einstein, John Dewey, John Maynard Keynes, Soren Kierkegaard. Julius Wellhausen, just name them. They're all dead. They're all dead. Dead men are controlling our society. Their ideas taught in our school, promoted in the media, uh, sometimes preached from pulpits, unquestioned allegiance. People are, it's a conventional wisdom. 
None of them are alive. There's a whole book about that by David Bree, Seven Men Who Rule the World from the Grave. Best book you ever gave me, John. They're all dead. And none of them died for us. And none of them had a book written about them before they were born. And none of them came back from the dead. I'm going with Jesus. You can have the other ones. I'm not saying they don't have something to tell us. But I, I'm not interested in replacing Jesus with them. We have a whole culture that's living on Boot Hill. We're living on Boot Hill. How about the Green Hill far away? How about that? Where the cross of Calvary, the King of Kings, died and came out of the grave. <coughs> That's what Paul was counting on. I got all kinds of teachings on the resurrection from Paul through Romans and verses I was going to give. My time's up. I'm sorry. One, one last illustration. There's a town in Ireland, Waterford, Waterford, Ireland. And I've been there once. They're known for Waterford crystal. Some of you had that real expensive crystal. I'm talking about $50,000 pieces of crystal. You got a museum there when they make that. And we went through that museum when we were there. Beautiful stuff. But they have something else there. There's a renowned tomb carving. I did not see that, but I've read about it later. A renowned tomb carving considered one of the finest in Ireland. It's a stone carving on the top of the tomb that portrays the devout Major James Rice, who's buried in it, and his wife. James Rice was the 11th time mayor of, of uh, Waterford, Ireland. And they, they, had a, they had a practice in the Middle Ages after the Black Death to carve some tombs with a picture of a decomposing body being gnawed and devoured by toads, vermin, and insects. And on this carving, a frog is eating uh, the stomach of the one inside of the carving. It's all stone. It's not the person. It's just stuff. So when you look at that, you're thinking of the person in the coffin. That's where they are. And so there's an inscription in Latin. And the inscription translates to this. Whoever you are that pass by, stand, read, and weep. I am what you'll be, and I was what you are. In other words, I'm dead, my body's rotten, and you're going to be there too. Listen, this world has its limits. If you're just trying to live for this life, I'm going to get mine before I die, and I don't care about the next life. You are making a huge, eternal mistake. You are dominated by a satanic lie. The physical world, no matter how attractive it is, has its limits. You don't want to be what Paul called men of this life, who mind earthly things. Can't look past this life. Turn with me to Romans 4. I'm sorry, I've got to go to one passage. 25. Speaking about Genesis 15, 6, and where God says, uh, it, Abraham believed God it was imputed to him for righteousness. It says in verse 23 of Romans 4, 
Now, it was not written for his sake alone, not for Abraham's alone, that it was imputed to him, but for us also, to whom it shall be imputed, if, if, if. You don't get this automatically. If we believe on him that raised up Jesus, our Lord, from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and raised again for our justification. The word uh, delivered for and raised for is better translated delivered because of our offenses and was raised again because of our justification. And the point is, Jesus died for our sins, and he'd still be dead if his death was not efficacious for those for whom he died. He couldn't have come out of the grave till your sins and mine were paid for. The fact that he did shows that they're fully paid. Amen. Fully paid. The bill has been paid. Turn to Romans 10. I said one, I'm going to give two. <laughs> I lied from the pulpit. Forgive me, Lord. <laughs> Romans 10 and verse 9. Paul writes this. If you're not a Christian, listen to this. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. You shall be saved. For with the heart, man believes to righteousness, and with the mouth, confession is made to salvation. For the scripture says, whoever, whoever, Believeth on him shall not be ashamed, for there's no difference between the Jew and the Greek. The same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. Here it is, first, here it is for anyone that's not a Christian. For whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Well, what if I don't call on the name of the Lord? Then you won't be saved. God at great cost to himself, has sent his son to die for our sins. He expects a response. He requires a response. He requires a response from every person on this earth. Now, we're not saved by our faith. We're, we're, saved, we're, we're saved through that. It's just faith is the hand of the heart that reaches out and does takes what God's giving our faith is not meritorious. It's simply the means by which we take for ourselves what God has done. If you've never trusted Jesus as your Savior, do it now. Why would you wait? Why would you put that off? You don't know when you'll be in eternity. It might be before you think. And so may God speak to your heart and hear the gospel, Paul's gospel. Read the book of Romans. Let it sink deep into your soul and your heart. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for what we've looked at today. Challenge us by your truth. Bless us by your word. Accomplish your purposes in our lives. Forgive us for our sins, O Lord. We remember the book of Romans says there's none righteous, no, not one. And we remember that the book of Romans teaches that this fallen world has a reprobate mind. But those of us that are trusted Christ have a renewing of our minds. So as we take the bread and take the cup, renew our minds, Lord about the preciousness of our Savior and our salvation. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord, as we go from this place, loving you more, trusting you more, may the power of your love and the light of your word shine forth in darkened world as we
go from this 